Hi. This is a prototype of Oxy-1. A sequencer part of an Indiegogo campaign. It's competing in an increasingly crowded market of desktop sequencers that can also control modular gear. In this video, I'll take a look at how it works, how it competes with its peers, and overall pros and cons. Before I start, an important disclaimer, I'm not affiliated with this product in any way other than they sent this unit over for review. The links to the campaign in the description are not affiliate links, so there's no upside for me whether this campaign succeeds or not. Also, while this seems to me like it's pretty far along in the development cycle, the workflow isn't fully refined, and regardless, crowdfunding campaigns are always risky, both in terms of timeline and sometimes actual delivery. So with that said, let's take a look at what makes Oxy-1 special. I'll start with an overview. Its defining feature at first glance is obviously the 16 by 8 RGB pad grid. It's not velocity sensitive, at least not in this prototype. It might be a stretch goal. And as expected, it can be used for sequencing, whether it's for drum style sequences or melodic sequences. Aside from sequencing notes or drums, the pad grid can be used for a few other purposes. When put in keyboard mode, you can play any of the instruments that it's sequencing. In the keyboard view, the first 12 pads are used to play semitones, and there are eight octaves that you've got direct access to. Then these four pads have different functions depending on the keyboard view of the track or sequencer type that you're viewing. So for example, in chord sequencers, when you play chords, you use the first two columns to set the chord type. So this is a minor seven, minor at nine, or just a uh, simple triad with a bass. And then this column handles voicing and inversions. And then this is the chord spread. So the chords can get pretty big or small. While we're on this topic, you can mute or unmute the modifiers. So if the modifiers aren't muted, then every time you press a modifier, the chord will play. But if I mute them, then you'll only hear the changes when I press a new chord. There are other functions for these rows depending on which track type you're viewing. So for example, for um, log tracks, you can activate a roller at different speeds which obviously makes sense for drum style tracks. Same goes when you're in drum mode or multi-track mode. You can select different tracks using this column or just unselect a track to access all of the um, drums in this case that are connected to the sequencer. And then you can mute or unmute different uh, tracks using these buttons. And this row works as a solo. And you can solo one or multiple tracks with a quick tap. Anyway, back to the overview. So these pads can be used for multiple purposes. The last main purpose is the arranger where the top half is used for storing patterns, 16 patterns per sequencer. And then the bottom half is used for both a clip launcher and for pattern chaining. Oxy-1 has four sequencers. I say sequencers and not tracks, even though they are tracks, because you can put any of the sequencers into a multi-mode for sequencing drums, like I showed you earlier, but also for sequencing monophonic melodic tracks, up to eight monophonic melodic tracks. So theoretically, you could go up to 32 monophonic tracks if you use every sequencer in multi-track mode. There are four sequencer types, either mono, poly, chord or multi-track. For simplicity's sake, I used sequencer one here as a mono sequencer. This is a poly sequencer. This is a chord sequencer. 
and this as a multi-track sequencer, though, like I mentioned, you can assign any type sequencer to any of the sequencers. Oxy1 has a few interesting generative features, the most important one of which I think is the harmonizer. So the idea is this. I've got two tracks here, and you can see track one has a bunch of notes across the octave spread out, and track two is just a bass line. Anyway, these two, if I were to play them normally, you'd hear multiple notes, but they are now set to be slaved or to follow track three or the chords in track three. So once I hit play, you'll just see the root note and some octaves dancing up and down because of another generative feature. Anyway, I'll need to go into track three and then say, choose a different chord. Let's go for this. And then the notes in these tracks will rely on the notes in the chord to be limited to what they play. If I change the chord, then the notes in the arpeggiated pattern and potentially the bass, obviously, will change as well. So pretty nifty feature, I think, the, um, the follower feature. It's kind of like the noodler, if you've seen my review of that. Notice the bass note in track two is also following track three. We're still on the overview, let's continue. On the left are additional control pads, an OLED screen that's visible from any angle but is relatively small, and four push encoders that seem to me like very high quality ones with a good response. The enclosure is thick machined aluminum and feels super solid, so if someone breaks into your house, you may be able to use this in self-defense. The Oxy One also has a built-in rechargeable battery. This isn't the final version, so I don't know how long it'll last, but it worked for me for at least five hours. From a connectivity perspective, if you're not using a battery, it's both powered and can send MIDI over USB. It's got TRS MIDI inputs and outputs. Both are TRS type B currently. Hopefully they'll change it to type A in the final unit. This is the split, which I understand is going to be an optional part of the campaign. It takes TRS MIDI and power and can split that up into two MIDI jacks this one for channels one through eight and this one for channels nine through 16. And aside from that, Oxy One has eight CV outputs and eight gate outputs. These are fully assignable, which is a pretty nice touch. So for example, you can use them to sequence polyphonic modular or just use them as modulation outputs for the mod lanes or the LFOs or any combination of the above. Finally, in terms of connectivity, this also has Bluetooth MIDI, which wasn't working well in my prototype, but Oxy said they were on it and that the shipping version will work well, which would be nice because using Oxy One with just an iPad, whether battery powered or with a camera connection kit without Bluetooth can be a lot of fun, I think. Same goes for using this with a computer. I think that Oxy One pairs nicely with software instruments on a computer, so no need for all this hardware if you're just in a creative mood and want to use Oxy to explore a few ideas. Let's take a look at a few more of the performance functions of Oxy One. Well, I'll set a chord in motion here. I mentioned earlier there's a randomization option that uh, will let you randomize things non-destructively in real time. So for example, I'll go to pattern one, and uh, what I've got going on here is randomization of the octave, so I can eliminate that totally, and the pattern will play within just one octave, or I can have it bounce around increasingly across multiple octaves. I can uh, randomize triggers, so trig probability for the entire pattern, and you can set trig probability on a per step basis as well. You can add re-triggers, which is, uh, I think should be ratchets. Not everything here <laughs> works, uh, at least not yet, obviously. And you can set velocity. If I was um, using velocity here, that would work. Anyway, so those are the um, non-destructive randomization options. And you'll see some quirks um, as we use this. Anyway, a fun destructive option. I'll get this out of follower mode by changing the scale. Shift functions are labeled here, so change the scale like this. Anyway, let's go for a minor scale. So this is my original pattern. Let's maybe just silence the bass. Okay, if I didn't like this pattern, I could go into the random generator and change it up a bit. I can just hit this quickly to mix things up. And then if I hold this, I can change a bunch of different parameters like the humanization, the randomness, the uh, density of notes, 
and you can even randomize the scale. And then that will generate a new pattern. So if this is say too dense, I can reduce density. And uh, yeah, a bunch of options here, as you can see, I won't explore all of them. Uh, that was yeah, too sparse. And uh, yeah, if I don't like what I did, there's a handy undo function. Let's see how far that goes, no undo steps. So one undo, but one undo is better than nothing. And there's a redo, which is also nice. More performance controls, you've got CC controls up to four parameters on the track types that are mono, polyphonic, or chord tracks. So that's four uh, parameters that I could change over here. And you can change their destination, I think, by holding shift. Yeah, and change which CC they control. And then you can later on assign these CCs or these knobs to CVs going out the back. So four CC lanes for the poly, mono, or chord tracks. And then the multi-tracks have eight CC lanes, one CC lane for each of the either drum or melodic sequences within a multi-track. Yeah, and if it sounds confusing, it is until you get used to it. The fact that there are multiple tracks within a sequencer, if you want it that way, does mean that a few things are handled in two ways. One for sequences that don't have multi-tracks, and another for sequences that do have multiple tracks. Moving on in terms of performance, aside from the sequencing options, you also have an arpeggiator per track. So let's mute this and you control the arpeggiator. Yeah, you can't do it when you're sequencing, you have to enter keyboard mode and then press this, turn on the arpeggiator and you can then, um, let's play. Yeah, play arpeggiated notes and obviously hold it as well. And there are the usual suspect patterns. And uh, octaves, gate controls, and a time division for the arpeggiator. That's separate from the um, sequencer time division. And you can have up to four arpeggiators running at once, which is cool. Another interesting performance functionality of Oxy-1 is that it has global controls for certain parameters. So let me explain. Notice that I can change the uh, velocity here, for example. It says global velocity and shows you a range, which was a little bit confusing to me initially because it's the same number. Anyway, if you program different velocities into different notes in a pattern, so for example, let's make this a lower velocity and this a higher velocity. There we go. Then now when we're changing uh, values, we're changing a range. So the range of parameters goes up and down. And that applies for a number of parameters, including modulation, by the way. So if you set an automation for, let's say, the mod wheel, if you set a range for that, then you can move that range up and down, which is pretty neat. That also applies to the chord tracks. So for example, you can have global control over the spread and the type, it doesn't say what you're changing here, hopefully it'll change that, but you've got global control over type voicing and whether or not you add the bass note in the chord or not, which is also pretty useful. Before I dive into sequencing in detail, just a quick word about the overall workflow. First, a lot of it isn't final. This is a prototype, obviously. So things may and actually should change. In general, the design of Oxy-1 is almost completely menu-free, which is a good thing, of course. The trade-off is that there are many shift functions and combos, and many parameters are scattered in different places, and you sort of have to remember by heart where they are. So for example, if you're programming a sequence and you wanna shift the entire view up and down, you access that using the division button. And to add to that complexity, remember we have some sequencers that handle just one sequence and others that handle multiple sequences potentially, again, which is a powerful feature, but then accessing some parameters is done differently in multi-track sequencers as opposed to single track sequencers. So for example, you set the time division of regular tracks or sequencers just by hitting the division button. But if you go into a multi-track sequencer, you need to set the individual timing by holding one of the pads and then holding this button, which lets you set the time division here using this knob as opposed to you know this knob earlier. But you can select tracks and then do it using this knob. So what I'm saying is there are things here that hopefully will be organized a little bit better and now sort of jump around a bit. Also, some shift functions require you to hold the key combo to edit the parameter. 
as opposed to just staying there and then letting you edit functions. Some require a long press like that and do stick around. It takes a while to learn these. Again, hopefully this will be refined in the final product. And then a little bit more complaining if you don't mind. Um, the arpeggiator uh, LED has a few states based on whether you're using it or not and whether it's held or not. So for example, if it's not held and not used, it's totally off. If it's on, it's lightly lit. If it's on and held, it's uh, very bright and blue. And if it's off, and still held, then the LED changes to, to white. It, it's just a little bit hard to know what's going on. It, it may be like this in the, in the preview controls, depending on which workflow they settle on. And again, all this might change. I'm just showing you a prototype. So let's take a deeper look at sequencing. You can delete everything by holding Shift and X. You either see a whole octave if you're in a scale, or if you choose a chromatic scale, then you'll see eight semitones. Let's just go for a, uh, a scale. So sequencing is what you'd expect. By the way, I have preview on, so you don't necessarily need to hear the notes as you punch them in. And by the way, you mute and unmute tracks using shift. So that's basic sequencing. You can also set ties like this. The way you edit ties is a little bit odd here. You can't delete the whole thing, you sort of have to chase it. Again, hopefully they'll refine this. You can see a little bit of quirkiness going on here. So uh, this is how you're supposed to delete ties. Like I mentioned earlier, you can scroll up and down using division in this knob, and then you'll see the, um, the root note here. And then if notes are hidden, which is pretty nice, you'll sort of see a hint of them on top or on the bottom based on where they are. There's no zooming in and out. Sequences can be up to 128 notes long, 128 steps long, and you change pages like this. So page one, page two, three, four, and go to five through eight by double tapping this. So this is page eight. You can see the color change there, hopefully on the camera. This is page five, and this is page one. There are a few shortcuts here, like transposing up and down by holding the button, and then you can edit additional note parameters by holding the note. So let's say just add, uh, this note here, you hold it, you've got velocity, octave, gate, and a mod wheel status. Uh, you can control one CC lane directly or go into CC perform mode and control up to four CCs per step. And you can also live record these. And then there are additional parameters available if you hit step chord. So glides, trig probabilities, retrigger, which is ratchets and an offset, this does support micro timing. If you're step sequencing chord sequences, they have an additional layer of uh, information. So you'll see the color of this uh, pad change, hopefully on camera. Um, you hold the pad and then can change the chord type and voicing and then access additional parameters. Here, strum, trigger, retrig, these don't work well in the prototype, but potentially you'll be able to strum chords and so on. When you're sequencing chords, you can also turn on preview. So you can preview and then uh, insert the chord. You can also edit multiple pads at the same time by holding them at the same time. Maybe that doesn't work for chords, but I think it does work Yeah, for, uh, for melodic sequences. A few other things, you can use these arrows to shift notes around left and right in the sequence. So say if you come in too late when you're recording, you can change that or shift up and down. You don't scroll using these, you literally shift the notes around. And then one other interesting feature, let's say you're sequencing chords and I sequence this and then this and then this, sort of to practice oops, my progression, the extend function lets you double the length of this progression and spread it out over a few bars if you hit it enough times. There's no shrink function, but it's just a nice way to get chord progressions kicked off and going, and then you can jump around using the page buttons. So that's more or less step sequencing. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a mess. Let's mute these and generate something randomly. Maybe increase the range. Okay, cool, what else? You can record live. So if I don't like this pattern, delete it. Oops, not randomize it, but delete it. Go into keyboard mode and Press record and just sequence that way or using an external keyboard. And I think I mentioned this earlier, if you go into CC perform mode, you can uh, motion sequence 
any of the four parameters that you choose to control over MIDI or over CV. So that's sequencing more or less. There's obviously more information in the manual. Once you've got patterns set in place, you can go into the arranger and then either launch different patterns or sequence them. The arranger has three functions, pattern storage on the top part, like I mentioned earlier, and then either clip launching or clip chaining on the bottom. So let's for a change look at uh, sequencing drums. So I can go into the arranger and save this into a new slot. So now I have an empty pattern with um, currently nothing, but let's just keep this simple. Okay, so that's pattern one. I can go into the arranger and save this. You know what, let's save it here. So I know where I'm at and then save it also here and then load up this guy and um, go into the sequencing and add great so that's pattern two now you need to save patterns before you switch around to anything else so go back into the arranger save this into slot two and now i can load this pattern anytime i want or load this one so like i mentioned top half just storage we're loading and saving patterns where you've got 16 patterns for each of the tracks storage of 16 patterns per project per sequencer now the bottom part is either clip launcher or arranger so the first thing you'll need to do is put clips onto the clip launcher so i could take this guy copy it into here and take this guy and copy it into here and now we have a potential progression now to get the progression going i need to turn the arranger on and be sure you save your patterns before you hit play, because when you hit play, it just erases the current pattern and loads up the next one. And now you'll see we're toggling between these two patterns, and we have thus created a pattern chain. You can set a few properties for the clip in the chain, for example, pattern change, uh, color, which applies, uh, I think, to the pattern as well and then um, number of repetitions or uh, infinite repetitions, in which case the sequencer won't move forward. So that's as it is now, uh, obviously a lot of potential refinements for this in the future for easier sequencing. All the status of what's going on here below can be saved as a song and you get, I think up to 16 songs per project and you can store I think 15 projects. Uh, again, a bit quirky here, how you load or save songs, it's not labeled again currently. And same goes for projects. You need to touch the right knob to load either a pattern or a project. Anyway, moving on, you've got four LFOs, one per sequencer, and these LFOs called mod here have uh, a bunch of shapes as you'd expect from an LFO and a lot of destinations. I won't cover all of these. Some of these are just, you know, wiggling parameters or CCs around, but others can be pretty interesting generative uh, controls, like for example, modulating the time division of a pattern to create Krell-like sequences. And then moving on to interact with MIDI or CV gear, you can send uh, a sequencer to a uh, MIDI destination, one of 16 channels, or off if you want to use it for CVs. And then for the multi-track sequencers, you can do that on a per track basis by holding this and then changing the channel. So each track can control a different uh, channel potentially. And then, like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, the CV and gate outputs are completely configurable. You do that in the CV gate menu. So here too, it's a split control. The left eight columns control the CV outputs, the right columns control the gate outputs, outputs one through eight and one through eight. And then you choose what gets sent to what output based on the sequencer you want to send to that output and the and what you want to send to that output. So for example, I've got the four gates here corresponding to these four gates coming out of track four and using track one of track four, track two of track four, track three of track four, and track four of track four. And then this CV gate is controlling Atlantis, sending CV and gate using voice one, of track one and the gate for voice one. So you could potentially have multiple voices here, but if you wanted say to send an LFO out of output one from track one, then you'd go into here and then choose um, 
LFO in this case, and you can even add uh, an offset. So I know that doesn't sound simple, but it actually uh, pretty much is. And then wrapping up the features, there's copy and paste. It doesn't work everywhere, so for example, at least not currently. So for example, it doesn't work in the arranger if you just want to copy and paste patterns, but it does work um, in the sequencers. And then there's the, I think only menu almost around here, except maybe chord selection with a bunch of settings here, uh, overall global settings. And you can uh, check out the manual for details about that. Okay, so let's talk about the pros and cons of Oxy1. On the pros side, first and foremost, Oxy1 is both fun and powerful. It can sequence up to four main polyphonic synths or drum machines. And since you can use multi-track sequencers as individual monophonic sequencers, up to 32 monophonic melodic tracks if you really need that many. Aside from simple sequencing, it has a few interesting generative style functions like randomization, the chord follower or harmonizers, motion sequencing, and the LFO that can be pointed to all kinds of interesting destinations. And it has up to four arpeggiators that can run at once, which I think is awesome at different time divisions, by the way. Further on the pros side, if you're into modular, it has eight fully assignable CV outputs and eight fully assignable gates. So a lot of modular muscle there too though frankly a lot of fun can be had just with Oxy and a bunch of software instruments. In terms of price and competition, it costs more than a Keystep Pro or an SQ64, and it doesn't have a keyboard, obviously, but it does have the grid and a very compelling feature list. Then there's Squarp Pyramid on the higher end, which costs a bit more than this and has a different but also compelling feature set that's worth taking a look at, but no grid or uh, as many CV and gate outputs as this if you need that much I.O. And it should be said that at this price range, there are also sequencers that have built-in synths or samplers. There are too many of those to compare, but I'm sure many of you will ask how this compares to the Deluge. The grid is actually exactly the same size. Deluge has an excellent sampler, looper, and arranger, and an okay synth, and unlimited sequencing capabilities with as many tracks as you want and zooming and, and all that, but it is more expensive than Oxy1 and doesn't have any of its more advanced generative features like the harmonizer or random chord generator. So I'd say if you're into grid sequencing and have the cash, the Deluge is a better option, but if you like the generative features that you saw here, then those aren't available on the Deluge, at least as of yet. This also has a mono grid mode. I didn't check that, leave a comment below if you want me to, but that's also a nice plus that this has and the Deluge currently doesn't. Other nifty hardware pros are the battery, a screen, which I think is better than not having one, and to a certain degree, Bluetooth. It wasn't available for testing uh, properly here. Regardless, Bluetooth does have latency, so in a combined setup, it might not be useful for you, but if you're using this just with an iPad or with a computer with Bluetooth, it could be a lot of fun. So that's pros and competition. Let's talk about cons, and I like to split these into hardware cons and software or firmware cons. On the hardware side, number one on my cons list is that the pads aren't velocity sensitive, like many sequencers, but still, it's nice to want. Uh, I'm not aware, by the way, of any other 128 pad grids that have that, but if they pull that off as a stretch goal, that would be quite a feat. Aside from that, yeah, the screen's a bit small, though it's legible as long as you're reasonably close. The size isn't much of an issue as much as that the encoders and your hands sometimes get in the way of seeing what's on the screen. You, the viewer, have the benefit of an overhead camera, but an easy solution would be to place the sequencer on an angled stand. Finally, on the hardware cons, there's only one MIDI out unless you get the split or another MIDI through, obviously. Then on the software or firmware side, I'm going to ignore the bugs because hopefully they'll fix as many as possible. They did while I was trying this out. And it seems like any sequencer release these days has them. So I think it's more an issue of how responsive the developer is to fixing bugs than whether it has them. However, there are the few nuances that I mentioned earlier in the workflow that aren't fully baked. And those will change based on, I think, your feedback if you choose to support this campaign. I won't repeat everything I said in the video again. Some odd shift behavior, odd LED behavior, loading and saving patterns. Some of these need to be looked at and hopefully refined. And all that said, I think the user interface will always have some level of complexity because Oxy1 is so feature packed and because of the fact that you have both main sequencers and then multi-track sequencers that have multiple tracks in them. So that to me is the biggest item on the firmware wishlist. Don't add any more features, just refine the quirks in the workflow. 
But if I was forced to say a few things that I'd like to see here, the first is custom chords so that I can program any chords that I like, including chords that aren't in a single scale. Currently, the chords are just diatonic. Second, I'd like to see more note layouts. So currently you just have this rigid layout, which is sort of hard to play, uh, and it does give you access to eight octaves, but I'd like to see maybe a scale mode which condenses the notes that aren't in the scale um, and a, an isomorphic view, a guitar-like view like on push two or the instrument would be nice. Yeah, and, and there are obviously a lot of things that can be added, but like I said, just refine the stuff that's in here and this will be a pretty compelling sequencer. So that's it for Oxy1. If you enjoyed the insights in this video, you may very well like my ever-expanding book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks available to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful. Don't forget to ring the YouTube bell if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching. Thank you.